Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can we open with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we seek to understand your will for us, as we think about others, need to know you, and we pray, Lord, for one another. You know the needs that all of us have in this world of sin and suffering. And um, sometimes, Lord, we're burdened down with the difficulties and trials that surround us and our friends and loved ones. <clears throat> so we just ask, Lord, that we can trust in you, that your will is being worked out, and that we can play the part that you have for us in revealing your character to the world. Help us to understand the things that we're studying here in 1 Samuel and how they apply to us, to this movement, and to this church, uh, that we can have light for our feet, that you can help us in the decisions that we make each day. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so switch my glasses so I can see better there. Now, we've been looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now, Dwight, you gave me this different uh, version of this document that you had prepared. What was different in this one? Just some material that was missing from the other? Or? Okay. When you, when you, we were discussing yesterday, getting up to about 1 Samuel 3 verse 9. Yeah. And now there's two paragraphs that follow after this you mm -hmm. just scroll past one of them yeah yeah and this uh, and those weren't in the other one that's correct okay yeah and that's where we're going to start reading here so i'm just going to read over the one to nine and then we'll read these spirit of prophecy uh comments here and the child samuel ministered unto the lord before eli and the word of the lord was precious in those days there was no open vision and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And we know, of course, that, that before the lamp of God went out, Samuel was laid down to sleep in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, is what it says in Hebrew. Okay. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou calledest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Or alternate version, thus did Samuel before he knew the Lord and before the word of the Lord was revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down and it shall be. If he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Okay, so we'll read these Spirit of Prophecy statements and we'll have some discussion on this. Of course, anybody can participate. As Samuel grew older, the anxiety of his parents in his behalf became more intense. Many were the petitions offered that he might not be contaminated by the wickedness reported concerning the sons of Eli. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Now this, uh, it goes on, right? So same, same article, Signs of the Times, December 15th, 1881. This is paragraph three. But when 12 years old, the son of Hannah received his special commission from the Most High. The circumstances of that call are best related in the simple and touchingly beautiful language of the sacred writer. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out of the temple where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel. Supposing the voice to be that of Eli, the child hastened to the bedside of the aged priest, saying, 
who am I? For thou calledest me. The answer was, I called not my son, lie down again. Three times Samuel was called, and thrice he responded in like manner. And then Eli was convinced that the mysterious call was the voice of God. But feelings must have stirred the heart of the high priest at that hour. God had passed by his chosen servant, the man of hoary hairs, to commune with a child. This in itself was a bitter yet deserved rebuke to Eli and his house. So in our discussion of these verses, we can see Ellen White's bringing out these points, uh, especially the idea of uh, passed by, right, which... You know, you should have highlighted there, Dwight. But you could have delight, highlighted the whole thing, I guess. So one is we know that he's he's going to be 12, right? This is when he receives his commission, right? And, of course, we have the three times. So we have three times that Samuel's called, and three times, or thrice, she uses, he responded in like manner. Okay, but and there's... And then you underline then. Then Eli was convinced that the mysterious call was the voice of God. So, Dwight? Okay. There's one point that we are, we're seeing, but we're not observing. When Samuel responded three times to Eli, that's correct. Yeah. But if you look closely at 1 Samuel 3, verse 4, that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here am I. So he's responded four times, three times to Eli, once to the Lord. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, so he, he went to Eli. So the first time he just says, here am I, or here I am or whatever. Right. Uh, Depends on, you know, what kind of construction of the sentence you would want to have. We would say, here I am nowadays. They said, here am I. We wouldn't say it that way. So he responds verbally, but then he he then goes to Eli and repeats it. So what what would be the significance of that? Would it, would it be the three and one combination? No. No, because we're going to have the fourth. The three one combination is the fourth time when God calls him again, Samuel, Samuel. And then he knows that it's the Lord. That would be the fourth. But what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is that the first time he responds to the Lord, now he responds three times to Eli. Eli, yeah. Eli recognizes that the Lord is directly calling Samuel and gives instruction mm-hmm. to Samuel. And wow. then you have, then you have that, Next time, the second time that Samuel responds to Jehovah comes after the three times he's responded to Eli. So you yes. actually, so you're yes. actually having five responses. Yes. Okay. I understand. What's the significance of it in your thinking? Does that, do those five responses in total signify Samuel being a wise virgin? Hmm. I don't know. I I mean you could you could argue that, but I don't see the significance of it myself. Because I don't I don't look at it that way. So what I what I look at is, you know, he, he says, here am I, but he, he goes to to Eli. I mean you could say it's five times that that phrase occurs. Right. So maybe but I would think that we would have to put more, we'd have to have more to sort of say that that's what it's symbolizing here. At least I would. Uh, you know, because when Ellen White says it, I mean, what, what she's doing is Samuel was called three times and three times he responded in like manner. Now, it's sure, it does say that he says, here am I, Right. But that's still one response. He goes to Eli, right? So first he just says, you know, he he just responds to the sound, but there's no one there. So then he goes to Eli, right? That's basically the way that I would look at it. So 
I mean, if you're going by what's said here, you can say, well, there's five times he says, here am I. So, you know, you could say, well, that's a symbol of the wise virgins, but that showing that he's a wise virgin. But I don't know if we need that or anything. Like, you know well, what I'm saying? The, I, I'm understanding your point. The, yeah. the point that I'm trying to make is, is Samuel then a representation of those us living at the end of time? Yeah, well, see, I think he represents a message, not really us per se. I mean, he represents those that respond to a message, I guess you could say. But he's going to be the message himself. Agreed. So I, I think the focus here should be on the three times, not really on the five times. That, you know, it's it's still one response, even if you he says, here am I twice in the, fir the first time. Well, okay. He, he gives. So, Go ahead. Well, so the way that I would look at it, the doubling that happens at the beginning, right? So that's what you would say it is. To me, the more significance would be that this is really about the second angel's message in our history. That would be more my focus. Is not that there is five, but there's two on the first one. Because we have, in our history, is 9-11, right? That's where we're marking this, which is the arrival of the second angel's message. You know, you could say both are correct. You know, we have the doubling on the, on the first call, right? And we have five altogether. But I think the main focus needs to be on, on where this is placing this in time. And, you know, maybe maybe the two are complementary, right? The fact is, it's at the second angel's message where you're going to have the foolish and the wise virgins sort of separated. Now, did someone else have a comment? Okay, Dwight, what do you think of that? Well, or anyone? we have a whole grouping of different symbols here. Mm -hmm. And I believe that all of them, just like what what we're both and all of us are addressing. William's comment, your comment, right on down the line. We're all trying to place this so that we have a, a clearer understanding of what's really going on. You're looking at Samuel in this case as being a message. I'm asking if, if this is also not relevant for us today because Samuel, at by this point, was now being selected, being chosen to give a message to the leadership of Israel, to the high priest. So it is personal to him, and it's also going to be personal to the leadership, because just as as Mrs. White writes, this in itself was a bitter yet deserved rebuke to Eli and his house, to leadership. Yeah. So one of the things that we're struggling with here is, is just the role of leadership in the final events, right? So we know that Eli is passed by, but that doesn't mean that he's cast off. I mean, he is in a certain sense, right? Because there's judgments that are going to come. But it doesn't mean he doesn't have a part to play in what happens. Correct. Right. Now, the way that I understand, and I've understood this for a lot of years, <laughs> you know, probably since, uh, you know, probably 40 years anyway, from when I really started studying uh, Spirit of Prophecy and looking at end time events and the role of the church. So I was very convinced early on that, because um, I didn't really know much about the church. Um, it took, took a while to get to know really about like the church and how it was organized. But it seemed obvious from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that, that the final movement, the final work that was going to be accomplished before Christ's return uh, was not going to be accomplished by some organization right? The institutions that we see as Seventh-day Adventists. And now it was also, you know, maybe some of it was more obvious, you know, 
or made obvious by what I saw in Seventh Day Adventists. Right? Maybe if I'd seen Seventh Day Adventists behave and act differently, I might have, you know, had some hope for the the organized church. But my view of the church was pretty much, you know, it was people who had been raised Adventists and didn't really have much interest in Adventism. So they didn't have much interest in studying the Bible. There was just more a social club. And, and, and I didn't really expect anything more from the church than that, because that's what people do, right? So, so when we look at the role of the church now, and we look at the role of Samuel, I mean, my focus is that Samuel has to do with the message that comes after 9-11. But that's primarily the focus here when Samuel is called. Right. So it's a repetition of the three angels messages that occurs within our movement. Not so much the three angels messages as they occur. You know, from 1989 to the end of time, right, to the close of probation. But that is this is it. This is primarily meant to be understood as a zoom in to 9-11. And that's why I focus upon the, the idea that there's the two here I ams, that this that this is showing the arrival of the second angel's message at 9-11. We know also is uh, that there are in, a, in, there, in every reform line, we can zoom into that way mark and see another reform line. So there's a reform line within 9-11, which we looked at in the book of Judges, right, which has to do with this movement. And so the message of Samuel would be that message in how it unfolds in relation to July 18th and so forth. That's a lot rather long sort of convoluted explanation, but does that make sense to people? If you were going by that, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be a um, fourth angel message too? Yes. Yeah, the second angel's is the fourth angel's message. The fourth angel's just the second angel's message. Oh. Yeah, that, that's sort of my point, that this is referring to, to our history. So remember, in Ellen White's line, she just sees the other angel of Revelation 18 join with the third. The third arrives October 22nd, 1844. It's joined by the second. We know that, of course, in order for the second to happen, the first must be repeated as well. And, and, and so that first angel's message is that message from 1989 to 9-11, the second angel arrives at 9-11. And so, so this movement has all been about the arrival of the second angel. That is, this movement is preparatory to a message that, that Seventh-day Adventists are going to give, right? And that's where I've had the problem where people in this movement have, have misinterpreted the lines where they're looking for the Sunday law to come in connection with this movement. And yet we know that that's something still future, right? This movement is, is preparatory to it. We're not at midnight yet. Now we, in different lines, we've arrived to midnight. We've even been at the midnight cry, but we haven't been to the mid midnight on that line that Jeff had in 2016. We haven't got to that way mark yet. Because if we were at that way mark, we would see something very different as far as this movement is concerned. And one is we would have a message that we would be giving to Seventh-day Adventists, or at least we would be united in understanding a message to get to midnight. So if we're not giving that message, we're not at Boston. So so the question is, what is the role of the church? So uh, this brings me back to, um, so when we initially, what's the first date? that we had in 2020 what was the first date that was found after we had found november 9th 2019 we we use the symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month that's a hint so from ezekiel we use the 10th day of the fifth month and we arrived at what date in 2020 that became significant it wasn't july 18 gregorian it was july 18 julian Right. So that's July 31st. OK, so that was the first date that we had. We had July 31st, 2020. 
on the Julian calendar, but we inferred from that 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 was that could symbolize July 18th on the Gregorian calendar. Now, how did we get July 18th on the Gregorian calendar, the 26th day of the fourth month? What did we use for that? So we used Ezekiel for the 10th day of the fifth month, and we used Revelation 19 for the 26th day of the fourth month, right? So we had two different July 18th dates. So we had for July 18th as an attack on the United States by Islam. That was sort of we used, well, it must have to do with Islam because we used Revelation 9. Yeah, didn't I say Revelation 9? Angela, I thought I said Revelation 9. Um, You said 9. What's that, Jeff? Oh, it was July 31st, 2020. Yeah, so we had July 31st, 2020. That's the 10th day of the fifth month. And then we had the 26th day of the fourth month came next, right? So we didn't first have the 26th day of the fourth month. That was from Revelation 9. So we had from Ezekiel. And Ezekiel 20, specifically. And in Ezekiel 20, he's going to be having a vision on the 10th day of the fifth month. And certain of elders of Israel are going to come before him. Right? Yeah. So, I remember, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so when we have these uh, certain elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me, the way that we initially looked at this is... Well, maybe this attack would happen on the United States on July 18th. And then 13 days later, the church would come to this movement, to Ezekiel, to inquire of the Lord. That was the initial idea that we had. That's how we looked at the second date. So the so the second date, the July 18th, we had as a date, but we didn't have it as an attack as is, of Islam because it was just connected to the 10th day of the fifth month, which had to do with the destruction of the temple. So we, and and it was a week later that we came up with the the July 18th date. And and that was sort of a combination of me and Stephen working. Stephen was doing a a calculation, taking the the half half year and then taking that as 180 years, right? So 180, half of 360 a day for a year. And then going from 1840 to 2020, right, 180 years later. But then, you know, to get the July 18th date, I just noticed that the 26th day of the fourth month, which is in Revelation 9, in 2020 is also July 18th, just as the 10th day of the fifth month from Ezekiel was July 18th, Julian, right? So July 18th, Julian in 2020 is July uh, 31st, Gregorian, right? It's going to be 13 days after July 18th, Gregorian. So these two dates tied together became really significant. I mean, they're just, um, but the main point that I want to fo- focus on here is that we have certain of elders of Israel coming to inquire of the Lord. So what we should expect in some way in connection with this movement, with this message, is that there is going to be an inquiry by the leadership, certain of the elders of Israel, into this message. So can we connect that here with this story of of Eli? So even though Eli is passed by, there is these calls made to Samuel, and Eli will recognize that this is the voice of God. It's not going to save Eli, right, from the judgments, that are going to come upon the house of Eli, but it does show that in some way that the leadership will recognize what this movement has found at some point, whenever that is. Angela? Oh, I'm typing something there. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in chat. As soon as I'm like, I'll finish it and then I'll post it because I'm in the middle of doing something right now. Sorry. Okay. Okay. How does that sound to people connecting this with Ezekiel uh, 20? Now, the other thing is that Ezekiel 20 is in the seventh year of the captivity in the fifth month, the 10th day of the month. So what's the significance of the seventh year? Are you thinking Jubilee? 
Okay, well, so we have a symbol, obviously, from the Jew, from the sabbatical cycle, but we we can obviously look at the seventh seventh years symbol of the twenty five twenty, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to go to this that year. So it's going to be July twenty first, five ninety two, that you're going to have Ezekiel have his first vision. So I think. What I'm going to do is, okay, I'm going to go back to, so in 597, it's going to be March, March 6th. Did we say it's March 16th? Yeah. So March 16th, it's the second day of the 12th month in 597 BC in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar that uh, Jehoiachin is going to be taken captive. I mean, it says in the Bible it's going to be taken captive in the eighth year, but that's but that's when the the siege ends, right? So that's when uh, Jehoiachin uh, ends the siege, which he would have gone out to Nebuchadnezzar, surrendered to him, and then uh, and then he's going to be taken captive, and Zedekiah is going to be placed upon the throne uh, in the following month. Okay, so I'm just putting this in here in this calendar converter thing. And then we're going to have Ezekiel's vision on the 10th day of the fifth month. So that's going to be... Uh, just a comment. What's that, Stephen? Yeah, you, I was you... saying that the sage was still in the... You hear hey, me? You're all, you were all broken up. I just... I can hear you now. Okay, I was saying that the... The siege was still in the seventh year, but it was the eighth year that Zedekiah then replaced Jehoiachin. That would be my understanding, because it was still March. It was still before the first day of the first month. But the yeah. siege ended. Yeah. So, so what's going to happen is Jeho- yeah, so Jehoiachin is going to, I mean, that's going to be the end. So there's going to be a time there is no king, right? For about a, for about a month or so, yes. Yeah. And then in in the the next year of Nebuchadnezzar, in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar, is because my understanding of what happens. So you got Nebuchadnezzar's army comes, uh, besieges Jerusalem. Just because it's Nebuchadnezzar's army doesn't necessarily mean Nebuchadnezzar's actually involved yet, right? So it's hard to know, but often. We find that when they talk about, you know, a king coming in, it's just his army initially. So Nebuchadnezzar himself has to make the decision to put Zedekiah on the throne in the place of Jehoiachin. And so it doesn't really tell us how long that process goes on. But from the time that Jehoiachin becomes the king of of Judah to the time that the walls of Jerusalem are broken down or He's taken captive. We'll put it that way. We don't know exactly how that happens. I don't think the walls are broken down. I think he just comes out and surrenders. He's going to have been king for three months and 10 days. And then the following month, Zedekiah is going to be placed upon the throne. Now, some people just try to say, well, you know, it's, you know, they're calling it the seventh year when it's really the, the eighth year. And there's all kinds of things that people try to do to gerrymander to fit into their their chronology. But anyway, you know, it's that that's how I understand it, is that it's going to be a period of time before Zedekiah gets placed upon the throne by Nebuchadnezzar. And that's going to be in the first month. And that that makes uh, uh, Zedekiah's uh, accession year uh, begin not when... Jehoiachin is taken captive. He has like an accession year that's almost a year long. But also they're changing from a a civil year to mark the reigns of, you know, jo- Josiah and and um, Jehoiakim and uh, and all those guys, right? So Jehoiachin's reign would have been counted fall to fall, which is how Ezekiel counts the years of the captivity of Jehoiachin. And then uh, 
but Zedekiah's reign is going to be counted spring to spring. So there's kind of this strange uh, change, and that's because it's going to be uh, Nebuchadnezzar that places him on the throne, and Nebuchadnezzar uses a spring to spring reign. So Zedekiah is going to have a spring to spring reign. Is how I understand it, and that that was the only way that I could resolve apparent contradictions in the chronology of Ezekiel is to assume two different counts for the captivity being fall to fall and matching uh, Jehoiachin's reign, who's the rightful king, and Zedekiah's reign that spring to spring. And, and that explains Ezekiel's chronology. But that's the only way I could do it. And that, that was a revelation I had from a dream in 2016. So once I had the dream and I tried something I'd never tried before, then all of a sudden the, the contradictions disappeared. So anyway, sort of a whole aside. Um, but what I want to say here about this, uh, this time. So from the time that, uh, it's going to be 2725 days from the end of Jehoiachin's reign to this vision of Ezekiel. So when we say it's in, in the seventh year, it's still 2,725 days. So it's more than seven years, right? It's seven times 389.28 if we use, uh, if we divide it by seven. So, so it's almost like seven times 390, almost the distance between that vision. So it's, it's really, it's a bit more than seven years. is what I'm trying to say now. I mean, if we counted from, because we're counting from the spring to the summer, right? So from 597 to 590. So it's going to be in the summer of 590. Well, I guess almost the fall, September 1st on the Julian calendar in, in 590 that he has this vision, which precedes the date for the destruction of the temple by four years. Because the destruction of the temple is going to happen in 586, right? So, so four years before the destruction of the temple, he has his his uh, second vision on the date that the temple is going to be destroyed. Now, this uh, here just uh, so just go to what Angela wrote. She she's been reading the book Woman of Vision uh, a couple few days ago which is a good book. Heidi read that back in 2018 when we were at uh, the School of the Prophets. Actually, we were staying with Brian at the time, and he had that book, and Heidi started reading it. That's where she found the vision regarding uh, the Civil Wars, was reading that book. But uh, Ellen White, in one of her early visions, saw a ball of fire come down and hit her heart area. It's very interesting to Angela, she says, because... She expects the fireballs on Nashville to be closely associated with divine revelation. Okay, so, well, there is no such thing as direct energy weapons, so, you know. These... There we will have to disagree, Theodore, quite vehemently. Yeah, it's just I know the science of this. So I know that that is science fiction, not not reality. Oh, it right. was science fiction. Now it's reality. Speak to people well, in the military who are working on these things, if they will divulge. Oh, they, they work on them, but there is no such thing yet. They're and, using them to start fires all around the world. Yeah, well, I don't believe that. It, it, it you know, but so we're going to have to differ on this one. I, 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 that is to me just nonsense. And I don't mean it as an offense to you. I'm just saying. They just, it doesn't. It's not. We choose to disagree. We agree on most things, so we let it pass. But my contacts yeah. are telling me differently. Yeah. Okay. If that science existed, we would know about it. We wouldn't have, it wouldn't be some underground secret thing. It would be well known in the literature. But anyway, so, but the idea that we're going to have these fireballs right, that they're connected with divine revelation, that makes sense, right, that, that, that it, it does become a symbol, right? 
Can we agree with that? That fireballs are, even if they're literal, they still have symbolism attached to them. Right? We go back to the story of Elijah. Right? We have these fire comes down from heaven. Any thoughts on that? So the question then. Then it's possible now. Now, my question, what I'm pondering over and over is, what is the fire that Satan calls down from heaven? Has he revealed this to anyone? Has God, has God revealed this to anyone? Well, I would just say new, new, nuclear bombs are pretty good in that sense to fulfill that role. That's something that's real. <laughs> Could be in more right. people are talking about new wars starting. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to talk about imaginary things like directed energy weapons when we have something that's actual, real. Okay, Jeff, you have a comment? Or how would how would it be figurative? Okay, Part well, we, how it... okay. So here we have the story of Elijah. Right, he's going to have fire come down from heaven. Now we know at the end of time. Uh, Satan is going to perform miracles, right? He's going to make fire come down from heaven in the sight of man, right? This is this becomes a sign. So we know that it, it's it's not just literal, even though we can say it has to do with nuclear weapons. Elijah thinks it has to do with directed energy weapons. But we know it's also symbolic of a counterfeit Holy Spirit, right? Just like the... Oh, you know, man. Right? Yeah. yeah, that could be, uh, that could play in that. Uh... So, so when we look at this situation of these messages, these calls that uh, that are being addressed by uh, the message up to, to Samuel, we're saying there's there's three messages, and then there is a fourth. Now, I'm saying that these three messages represent something internal within this movement, but the third one is going to be the third time that that the church is going to pay attention, right? Because Eli's going to give this mess, you're going to receive this message from Samuel that God had called him the first two times. I didn't call you, right? But then the third time, he's going to perceive that it is the Lord. So would there be something in the message that this movement is giving that at some point something happens that certain of the elders of Israel will come and inquire of the Lord regarding, because Eli's going to inquire after Samuel uh, speaks to the Lord, right? That could be easy to see. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's pretty logical that at some point the church, not as the in institutional stru a structure, but Adventist ministers, People within the church in positions. Probably well, well, known, probably well known individuals. Yeah, maybe some well known well. individuals. Obviously, we have to believe that, you know, we're not going to be the ones giving the message to the entire world. Right? There, there has to be many Seventh day Adventists and people who are competent, unlike us, to do that type of work. That they're that they're both are competent and also have an influence for this this work to to be brought to the world this message. So that's what we believe, right? We believe that there's going to be a loud cry. Now, when that happens, we know that God is going to be taking the work into His own hands. It'll be evident that that has occurred, but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be uh, competent people involved in proclaiming that message, right? doesn't mean that every single pastor and every single church administrator and every single uh, person who's in the Adventist church who's who's got some kind of leadership function is going to be uh, cast off, right? Now, we also know that in this judgments that come upon Eli, we see, uh, you know, that there's th those that are going to be poor, right? That they're going to come... And they're going to seek the word of God. So whatever that represents, the Ichabod part, I'm, I'm not sure, right? So the descendant, if it's the descendants of Ichabod that are the ones that are the, that want to be priests, and how we would interpret that is other things that we know from the spirit of prophecy. It could be the foolish virgins coming to seek oil, right? You know, for their lamps. But does that make sense to people? 
So at some point, we know that there are going to be people that the work that we have done in studying and and everything that this movement has done is it's going to come to fruition at some point. And that that would be seen here in this story of the call of Samuel. Okay, well, Acts 6, 7, what does that say, Angela? I mean, that, that's Stephen, the stoning of Stephen, I think, is in Acts chapter 6, isn't it? It's in 7, but Acts 6, 7, to back up what you're saying, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So elders of the church, those who are prominent in the church, who see the wrongs in the church, and see it falling, perhaps a bombing of Nashville, or seeing something catastrophic that nobody can dismiss happen to the main line, will come to those who are spreading this 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 message, and they will amplify it. Okay, and that's kind of interesting too, because the Acts six seven is right before Stephen is uh, presented. Um, so you got Stephen, who's going to be the subheading is Stephen is seized, Acts 6, 8, right? And that's going to be marking the close of probation, which would be the Sunday law in our history. So we can see prior to the Sunday law, the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. That is during the proclamation of the midnight cry to the church, right? So we know in our line, we have a midnight cry, it is going to be given to the church prior to the Sunday law. And that precedes the loud cry. And and when, when Jeff did that back in, was it 2015, when he, he started to focus upon this parallel, that's where he tried to, to maybe it's 2014, but he tried to bring these two together, the two 9-11s, right? That 9-11 was both, the empowerment of the first angel, which was originally how they looked at it. And then also is the arrival of the second, right? There was, he, he started to zoom into our lines, but he didn't realize what he was doing, right? So we, so we resolved that, that issue um, of what, what the problem was, why we have a midnight cry within Adventism that precedes the loud cry given to the world. It's not something... Because originally he paralleled the midnight cry and the loud cry together, which is true. But that's a bigger line that's zoomed out. So when Jeff started to zoom in, he didn't realize he was zooming in. Yeah, and this was 2014 that they started to see that. I'm not sure what Jeff thinks about it now, but uh, uh, I don't think he's ever resolved how these lines work. So we can see within this movement, within within Adventism, there has to be a loud cry, so to speak, before the close of probation. And that's this is what this would be talking about, that it's going to be just prior to the close of probation. In this case, Eli's close of probation, close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists, that you're going to have this uh, this message of Samuel and you know, certain of the elders of Israel will inquire of the Lord, just as Eli inquires of the Lord. So the leadership um, doesn't mean that all the leadership is lost. Now, of course, there's more to this because this story is going to be also a broader story as well. Is this making sense to people how we're looking at these verses or is there any questions? All of these are written for our time. And yes, they are very pertinent. If all our ministering brethren could have come to their Bibles together with the Spirit of Christ, respecting each other, and with true Christian courtesy, the Lord would have been their instructor. And of course, that's true of this movement, right? And this was not done. But the Lord has no chance to impress minds over which Satan has so great power. Everything that does not harmonize with their mind and their human judgment will appear in shadows and dark outlines. Now, sometimes we look at this and we think, how could we as Seventh-day Adventists not recognize the spiritual condition that we're in by looking at how we treat our brethren who differ with us? 
right? We should be able to recognize something so basic as the emotions that we feel, because people definitely have been emotional, towards those that differ with us. If I feel my emotions rising up, you know, what people usually do is it's righteous indignation, right? Have you ever seen people excuse their anger for having their, their feelings hurt? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. 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 I never assume that if I have indignation that it's righteous. You know, I'm not God. It's not very easy for me to be have righteous indignation. God can have it. And I, I'm not saying that we can't have it. But if 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 I feel my feelings rise up, I need to examine why my feelings are rising up. What is it that that's causing my feelings to arise? Is it is it really just, you know, me trying to preserve, you know, God's truth? Or is it something that's really personal in myself that I don't want to deal with? It's something you're and, just defending, defending yourself. Then. Yeah. In most of case, it is defending oneself. Yeah. It's our it's our pride, you know, that that rises up. So so we should we should know from the Bible in the spirit of prophecy that when when we have these sort of feelings that that something's wrong with us, but we justify it all the time. Self has far more to do with our religious experience than we imagine. And that's a pretty powerful sentence. Right. We actually use religion to avoid dealing with self. When self is crucified, when the stubborn will is subdued, then the language of the heart will be, not my will, but thine be done. O God, whom, whose I am and whom I serve, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. None will be as fixed stars, cold and immovable. This selfish, worldly dignity will no longer be maintained. There will be a beautiful blending of purity, elevation, and nobility, which is wisdom from above and the meekness and lowliness of Jesus Christ. An innocent lamb was chosen as a representative, representation of Christ. Now, you know, this is such such a difficult thing, right? That that this this paragraph. I mean, it's easy on the surface to see this in other people much more difficult to see this in ourselves and to be changed into that type of character is the whole purpose of the gospel and yet religion is used as a way of avoiding it selfishness is written on the human heart in plain unmistakable characters just as soon as the love of God takes its place, there is the image and superscription of Jesus Christ, his entire life amid a world filled with pride and selfish, selfishness was, without an exception, an embodiment of that charity that suffereth long and is kind, that envieth not, that vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, Thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 47. Here is presented before us the fruits of the grace of God, which every follower of Christ will manifest in his life and reveal in his character. If these manifestations are wanting, there must be most earnest seeking of God. By repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, we may receive the spirit of Christ here specified. And then we may indeed be called children of God and not children of the wicked one. We must have greater faith, then we shall have more of Christ. So again, a, a paragraph that we should all be able to understand, but much more difficult to put into practice. We can see this in ourselves, hopefully, where we would be in danger if we can't see that this applies to us. Anybody watching this who thinks, well, that doesn't apply to me, it does apply to you, right? If you say, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, then you're testifying to the fact that you're wretched, miserable, uh, poor, blind, and naked. 
and and that now we need to recognize that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So this is something that God wants to do in us, and and we know that within ourselves, within this movement, within the church, it's half the work. It's half the work yeah. dealing with ourselves. <laughs> That's probably all of the work, really. <laughs> You know, if this work is done, right, if we can learn to trust in God and rejoice in everything that that is happening to us and leave in God's hands the things that we can't control, our life will be a life that represents that of of Christ. You know, like like today I was, you know, just started worrying. Uh, I don't worry very often because normally I just leave everything in God's hands. But sometimes, you know, I start thinking about things and I start worrying about this and about that and these people and that people and what they're going through. And yet, you know, I've left them in God's care before and have just tried to represent God. And part of the worry is I know I don't represent God perfectly. You know, it's like, well, maybe maybe I screwed up. You know, maybe this is kind of my fault, which is probably a healthy thing in some ways. But to just leave it in God's care, because I can't control the past. I can't control the things that I've done in the past. I can't change them. Uh, But I can repent and change what I do from now on. And, you know, often we look at ourselves and say, well, I'll fail again, you know. But we have to trust that in spite of these errors, in our lives, that God is going to work these things out. That that's been my experience. Well, hopefully, you know, you guys can relate to it. The most precious fruit of sanctification is the grace of meekness. When this grace presides in the soul, the disposition is molded by its influence. There is a continual waiting upon God and a submission of the will to His. The understanding grasps every divine truth, and the will bows to every divine precept without doubting or murmuring. True meekness softens and subdues the heart and gives the mind a fitness for the engrafted word. It brings the thoughts into obedience to Jesus Christ. It opens the heart to the word of God. As Lydia's was opened, it places us with Mary as learners at the feet of Jesus. The meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his will. The language of the meek is never that of boasting. Like the child Samuel, they pray, speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. When Joshua was placed in the highest position of honor as commander of Israel, he bade defiance of all the enemies of God. His heart was filled with noble thoughts of his great mission. Yet upon the intimation of a message from heaven, he placed himself in the position of a little child to be directed. What saith my Lord unto his servant was his response. The first words of Paul after Christ was revealed to him were, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Meekness in the school of Christ is one of the marked fruits of the Spirit. It is a grace wrought by the Holy Spirit as sanctifier and enables its possessor at all times to control a rash and impetuous impetuous temper. When the grace of meekness is cherished by those who are naturally sour or hasty in disposition, they will put forth the most earnest efforts to subdue their unhappy temper. Every day they will gain self-control until that which is unlovely and unlike Jesus is conquered. They become assimilated to the divine pattern until they can obey the inspired injunction. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Angela posted some verses on death to self, Luke 9, 23 and 24, Romans 8, 13, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, and Colossians 3, 5. Okay. There's lots of scriptures, obviously, that, that we could apply. But, you know, the one is just being able to examine our motives. You know, as, you know, I've said many times, like when, when somebody triggers me, when I'm, I'm unhappy about somebody else's behavior. I really need to look at my myself, you know, especially if if my feelings toward that person are are negative, right? Like, because that's not God, right? Uh, you know, I've been dealing with this guy. I don't want to go into too much detail, but on Facebook, but he 
you know, he's he's uh, he focuses upon the evil that others do. And is totally self-justifying in all of his own actions. And, you know, that is us. Right. I mean, that's our nature. And, it, and it's so easy to feel self-justified when someone else has done wrong. Right. Either they've wronged you or they've wronged someone else. But does that justify us <laughs> that we can recognize the evil in others? Does that in any way uh, recommend us to God and, and, and is part of our justification? No, 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 not in, not in the least bit. Right. Being able to recognize evil in others will do me no good. Right. And I, and I can think that the fact that I'm calling out evil in others is, again, some way that I'm now being justified for my own actions. But calling out evil, evil in others, does that justify us? No, no, it's, no it right. does not. But at the same time, when you know sins are going on and you need to reprove them, or at least you need you need to notice them and desist from them. You see, this is the fine balance that, that we, we are challenged with, right? Well, yeah, but I, it, I, 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 I know I know that the uh, prophets realized that they were very weak and sinful men, too, but that didn't stop them from reproving sin when they were yeah. compelled to do it. Right. So so there is a place for reproving sin, and I'm not saying that there isn't. But for many people, they they substitute reproving sin in others for actually dealing with sin in themselves. That's true. God right. help us all. And it's true that if we have dealt with the sin in ourselves, our life is a rebuke. And and we and and how we reprove sin in others. Ellen White says that when Jesus rebu rebuked the Pharisees, that there were tears in his voice. It was not done in a, a self-justifying nature. And, and often what we see in others and, 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 and you know, I, I have seen so many people who rebuke others in a spirit of self-righteousness and, and, and they're not being productive, right? Like what they're saying is one is it's not going to help the person they're rebuking, but it, it's, it's not going to help anyone and especially themselves, but they do it as a means to to not deal with the sins in themselves. It, it it's it's so easy to deceive ourselves on this in this regard. Right. You know, I mean I've seen it in myself and I've seen it in others. That we can we can be very self righteous in condemning others and yet we do the same things. And it, it's just it's such a simple idea but it's, it's so hard to implement. It's, it's so deceptive. Okay, so this is uh, another uh, letter. So the other one was from Sanctified Life, page 14 and 15, which is a really good book. The very men who ought to be on the alert to see what God, the God, what the people of God need, that the way of the Lord may be prepared, are intercepting the light God would have come to his people and rejecting the message of his healing grace. Brethren Miller, I beseech you to come into harmony with the work of God for this time, so that you would have less confidence in your own opinions with an exclamation mark. And we need to take that, take that personally, right? Oh, that you might see that it is your inherited and cultivated stubbornness of heart, which is keeping you away from the light of truth. Again, an exclamation mark. And, and Ellen White doesn't use those lightly. I, I never use them, but <laughs> your self-esteem, your persistency in having your own will, but not according to God's order. You need to cultivate humility and meekness, that the Lord may have room to work for you. We all need the blessing of God every day, and you must have a realization of his abiding spirit in the heart. Your will is none too strong. If you place it wholly on the Lord's side, to be educated and trained by Christ, right? So even though we may be strong-willed, if we can place it on the Lord's side, we can be educated, right? We can learn in the school of Christ. 
The success of every work depends upon the blessing of God. If the Lord works with you, you will be able to do what he has appointed you to do. With God, one can chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight. But just as long as you maintain the spirit of Pharisaism, God's spirit will not, cannot work with you because you do not feel your utter dependence upon him. When you become learners in the school of Christ, you will have the simplicity and meekness of little children and will be putting, will be willing to counsel with your brethren and sisters and will pray earnestly for help from God. Your ears will then be opened and you will be enabled to say from the heart, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Right? So to be in that position where we can actually listen to God, that is the real problem. We aren't willing to listen. God's voice, we've rejected it so many times, we don't even hear it. God wants to put his spirit upon you, but he cannot do this while you are so full of self. When self dies, you will feel the quickening influence of the spirit of God. God's people are enjoined to seek for unity, that they may be framed together into his holy and holy temple for the Lord. You're God's building. You're God's husbandry. This is no time for alienation and discord, for the indulgence of a selfish, perverse spirit. Will you take yourselves in hand, or will you be ready to regard your stubborn, unyielding disposition as an evidence of faithful integrity? God forbid that you should be blinded, as were the Pharisees, and place good for evil and evil for good. You will never have any greater evidence than you have had as to where the Spirit of God is working. The Lord proposes to remove all occasion for men to doubt. He will give sufficient evidence to bring the candid mind to a right decision. But if you are determined to have your own way, if you are, like Saul, unwilling to change your course because of pride and stubbornness of heart, because of ignorance of your own condition or spiritual destitution, you will not recognize the light. You will say with Saul, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. The Christian life is not one of ease and restfulness, but is represented as a life of earnest work. The church must work. How? To please and praise and glorify self? Oh, no. Each sentinel must be at his post. Each soldier in his rank. He is not to place himself as though he paid the purchase money for himself. He is the property of Jesus Christ, body, soul, and spirit. Every part of him is to be treated as God's property. Here am I, send me. Speak, Lord, for thy servant here. How many lay all this responsibility upon the ministers, as though the ministers alone were meant by the working force? This is not the case. Every man and woman who has joined the army of the Lord is included in the working force. Not one is excluded. Then when the work shall close, every man shall receive the reward according to his deeds. Everyone in Christ's army must fight the battles of the Lord. Trials will come. Faith will be tested. God has warned us against presumption. Hold fast. Yield my post of duty? No, never. If resolutions which I know to be wrong are carried over my head, shall I be presumptuous? And shall I say, as did Elijah, it is enough? O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. No, be still and know that I am God. You are not using yourself. You are only an instrument in the hands of God. If one pushes aside the instrument, he thrusts aside the hand that is working that instrument. It requires fortitude to trust in God. Our captain was made perfect through sufferings. Shall finite man expect perfection of character without trial of every sort that Satan can invent? For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Precious words to every son and daughter of God. How I prize these words. They are precious to me, more precious than fine gold. I meditate upon them. They guide me when I am overwhelmed with perplexities and lead me to fasten 
and my hope upon the world's redeemer, and in him will I be confident. Through faith, although I may be disappointed in the words and attitude of my brethren, there is no reason why I should withhold praises from God. For he has never disappointed me. There's nothing, there, there has nothing failed me of all the good things he has promised me. Then is it proper for me to hide in the shadow? Is it appropriate for me to put my light under a bushel or under a bed? No. Let it shine. Let every ray of it shine. Look to the sun of righteousness and catch his bright beams. Shall I sing when under my bushel or under my bed? No. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. What is needed then is to set at work scores, yes, hundreds, who would have their light hidden under a bushel or under a bed. There has been most earnest work in establishing ministerial schools in different localities. These schools bring responsibilities, etc. Okay, so... So we are, all are to work. We are all to trust in God. There are souls who are willing to make any move for Christ's sake, but they think they are not qualified to do the sacred work of God. They have accepted the truth and rejoice in it, but they have not come to the point to cry, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. They do not seek to make terms with the Lord. Now, one of the problems I think here, I mean, we can all look at ourselves and we see we're not really qualified. But God gives us a work to do, right? So I may not be qualified to be the president, but I but I can be a janitor, right? You know, I, I still can do the things that are before me. And he that's faithful in little things, look at look at Joseph. What what did he do? He was faithful in Potiphar's house. He was faithful in prison, and God made him basically next to Pharaoh, right? So if we do those those things that God has given us to do, we don't really need to be discouraged about the fact that we we aren't great men or anything or great women, right? We're really nobodies, but God can still use us. Um, so this is about workers going into the cities doing work. I have the tenderest sympathy for your president, Elder Olson. I know his soul is weighed down with burdens. And unless those connected with him have the Holy Spirit's guidance, mistakes of a serious character will be made. Plans mingling the human element with sacred matters will be inaugurated, and men's ideas will be accepted as light when they are detrimental to the progress and success of the cause of God. <clears throat> Now, of course, this is easy to see. We've seen this, you know, obviously in the church, but we've seen it in the movement. We should see it in our own day-to-day -day life, that sometimes the human element uh, gets mixed with sacred matters. Ellen White says, I have carried these matters upon my soul until they seem to be eating away my courage in life. Now I can refrain no longer. I have spoken. Had I known of one, who would have stood by Elder Olson and given him that wisdom and counsel and help that he so much needs, I would have sent this, mat sent this matter long ago. But after writing it, I've drawn back from sending it. It has been a mystery to me how Elder Olson could receive and sanction two men of civil, similar religious character when he has no evidence that they are consecrated to God. They have manifested little of vital connection with God, and yet he has linked them together and sent them upon distant and important missions to do important work, demanding clear and sanctified wisdom. Agents who could look to heaven and say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Sounds like, uh, sounds like Eli, something like Eli. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I mean, I see the parallel here with Jeff as well, right? So I see it with Ted Wilson, too, with Diop. That guy is a monster. Yeah, I don't know anything about any of that. So I can't comment. I don't even know. I know Ted Wilson's name. I don't know who the other person is. But I don't particularly want to know either. Because our work is not to reform the organization, right? It's to give a message to, to whoever will hear. And however that unfolds, however God does that, 
it's going to be by him that it's going to be accomplished. Yeah, Jeff, you had a comment? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Elder Olson's pr proposition to have A.R. Henry come to this country, I could not sanction. Now, I know a little bit about that history. And this is what we have had, you know, people who who demonstrate an unsanctified character often put into positions of responsibility. I was compelled to say that we did not want him. God has presented his case to me since the Minneapolis meeting. He has never taken his position in reception of the light God has so graciously given for these last days. He's not honored the position he has occupied in the office because he has carried the spirit of A.R. Henry in full size. In him, there has been no diminution of self. God has revealed to me that the influence given to these men whose hearts are not right with God, who are not in harmony with God, will prove in the end a curse instead of a blessing. The confidence of the people cannot sustain these men if they pursue their course of action as they have done. Those who have subdued contrite hearts are tenderly regarded by the Lord. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Thank the Lord. I praise his name that he does not judge unrighteously. His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich man he has sent away empty. Read every verse from uh, the 32nd and 34th Psalms for they both contain important lessons. Okay, I'm going to just skip some of this unless there's something that Dwight wants me to look at. You know, obviously here there's, you know, it's in the context that there are those that God is going to choose in spite of the situation that exists within the church. I think we looked at this one before. Okay, that one we did. And this one. It's so what education. Okay, okay so. <clears throat> so look at verse 10. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. So this is going to be the fourth call, right? And the significance of it being doubled, we would say that that would line up with the mighty angel of Revelation 18, the fourth angel's message being the second angel. So this is the fourth call. Any thoughts on that? Makes sense. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Any other? So, so if we're going to have this fourth call, where would we line that up? Would we line that up with the actual Sunday law prior to the loud cry? So if we're going to take these three calls to something happening within this movement, that, that, that fourth. So here's a way we would look at it. We have, we have, we can zoom out to Ellen White's line. We have three angels message in Millerite history. Third angel arrives October 22nd, 1844. And then at the Sunday law, the second angel's message arrives again. But we know we've zoomed into that second angel's message arriving. And that's this movement, our history, which Ellen White hints at with the repetition of history. And also you can't have a third without a first and a second. So you can't have a second without a first. So if the second angel's message is repeated, that means the first is repeated. So that gives us 1989 to the Sunday law, right? Now, but we've zoomed into that within this movement. We've seen that we can zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. And we have the history of this movement. Well, more than just this movement, we have this whole other reform line that Jeff had addressed in 2016, that is from 9-11 to the Sunday law. But within that line, we can zoom in again and we have this movement more specifically that is prior to the Sunday law or maybe even prior to midnight. You know, so where would we place? I mean, obviously, this is the second angel's message. So if we're going to take those first three calls, where would we place them specifically? You understand what I'm asking? So if we were going to draw this line of these three calls. Would you put it on a um, big line? 
Well, that that's what I'm asking. So where would we, we put it on any line? <laughs> Whether we put it on the big line, we, we, we put it on, you know, 1989, 9-11, July 18th, you know, I do, do, do we use that as the first three and then the fourth is the Sunday law or, you know, we zoom in even further and put them just within the movement itself um, from 9-11 within this movement, these three, right? I mean, we have, we have options and obviously we could, we could place them in different spots and they would be correct because any reform line we have um, is going to parallel this. But if we're going to look at this, this what's that, Angela? Sorry, Theodore, this is so, so tough because the movement is so split. So are we talking about us here who are studying daily with you? Or are we talking about, 3 AMF, where I'm like, who are we talking about? This is so confusing to me at times. Okay. Like, where so, do we, what do we believe, really? <laughs> okay. So when, when I talk about this movement, I talk about the history of this movement as it's moved through. So obviously, those that have left the movement have left the movement, right? They're, they're not really part, they were a part of this history, just as in Millerite history, you had the Protestants. They were part of the first angel's message. Did they have any part in the second? No. Right. Except to reject it. Right. Those that did, that were not benefited by the first message had no part in the second, Ellen White said. Right. So, so we know that's true within this movement. So there are people. So we've had a, a first angel's message, the first call, the second and the third. So we have to decide how we would apply these these calls how we would draw it on a line. I don't know if I'm quite ready to draw it on a line tomorrow, but um, the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. So that means that this, this itself is a repetition of the three angels' messages. That is, I mean, there's different ways we could, we could apply this, but, it would, if we were going to apply the first three calls to this movement specifically, I would say that you would have to put this at the Sunday law itself. And that, that that's when this movement, it fulfills its purpose. But it could be midnight, right? It could be some way in which, you know, this is zoomed in even more. But at least I would say that the doubling represents the second angel's message, which is the Sunday law. Okay, so any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Yeah, I just got, a, got an email from somebody in 3AMF, and she was saying that prophecy tells us that Trump is going to be re-elected re and bring bring in the Sunday law. And yeah. I'm, well, I'll watch what she sent, but I'm just saying, yeah, you're so focused on this thing. You're so, so focused on, but you're not allowing yourself to see other facets of what God is showing us, you know. And yeah. I figure if Trump does bring in a Sunday law, it'll be a fairly mild one compared to what we are going to face. Like he yeah. might even just, just yeah. start doing it. Because we still have yeah. some time left. Well, yeah, there's a lot that has to be done, right, that, that's not done. So obviously the Sunday law can't happen yet. You know, and I, I believe that Trump's probably going to win. But what I'm looking more for is that, not that I want it, but that I think that's going to happen is really the United States breaking down even more. Right? So whether Trump wins or not, it, nothing is going to be able to save the United States at this point. Right? I Trump's, know that. Yeah. And, and many people are looking to Trump as a savior. But... Uh, you know, we just don't know what the future has to hold. Definitely prophecy doesn't show that Trump's going to come and bring the Sunday law. We, we've already dealt with that many, many times. Um, okay, so let's close with prayer. A dear, gracious, heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we've had to receive this message. I pray that each one of us can take it to heart, that we can recognize within ourselves our incapacity to, to do the work upon ourselves that you want to do. That we are not righteous, that our opinions don't matter, and that you indeed 
are going to take the work into your hands. We ask that you can begin with each one of us individually, that we can represent you truly to those around us. We pray for others. We know the trials that we face can be overwhelming. Uh, we pray for Kelly. He's got a doctor's appointment today. We ask that you can help him in the decisions he needs to make. And uh, all the things that we cannot control, Lord, we leave in your hands. And we trust in faith that you will work them out to your will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.